Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to week two of our Bible study through the book of Colossians. This is the Tuesday night Bible study here at the Greensburg Church in Nazarene. So we're beginning our way through the book of Colossians. And, and last week, if you watched with us, uh, um, we kind of just did an overview of the, of the book. And if you watched that video and you came back for more, I, I, I thank you. I'm glad you're with us. If this is your first time watching with us, thank you for joining us. Hey, no matter which one it is, do me a favor. Hit the like button, hit the share button. Help share the message of Jesus, this, this message about the study of his word uh, wherever you can. Do me a favor also, please post hello in the comments. I may not be able to respond right away as the video gets going, um, and, uh, but I will come back and say hello afterwards. Same with as the video goes, if you have any questions or maybe you have a prayer request or need, you can feel free to post, post those in the comments. And again, I will, I will get with you as, as I am able to do so. All right, like I said, for this week we're in Colossians chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 1 through 14. So I'm going to go ahead and read those first uh, 14 verses, and then we will kind of dig into it a little bit more in depth and go a little more slowly verse by verse. So Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love you have for all the saints. Because of the people reserved for you in heaven, you have already heard about this hope in the word of truth. The gospel that has come to you is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. You learn this from... Epaphras, our dearly loved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has told us about your love in the Spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you may walk worthy, walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God. Be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that that you might so that you may have great endurance and patience joyfully giving thanks to the father who has enabled you to share in the saints inheritance in the light he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves in him we have redemption the forgiveness of sins all right so i know there's a lot there and there's a lot for us to kind of cover here and and hopefully I can make it through this entire section tonight without uh, taking too terribly long. Again, I really don't have a set time limit to these videos. It's really just how long it takes to cover this section. So sometimes we'll go a little longer, sometimes we'll go a little shorter. It just depends on the section that we're trying to cover. Um, but tonight, again, understand in this section, Paul is is opening his letter to, to, the, to the Colossians. He's introducing himself. And he's also setting forth some ideas and some themes here that he'll come back to later as he begins to, to address the reason for writing this letter. When Paul sat down to write this letter, he's writing this as a Christian to a church full of other Christians who are being, who are being um, exposed potentially to some harmful doctrines that, that are contrary to the teachings of Jesus Christ. And he is writing this letter to address those and he is, he is setting them up here in this beginning section with some theological themes that will be important as we move forward through the rest of the letter. Um, that being said, let's kind of jump right in here. So in verse 1 it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother. So Paul begins by identifying himself as apostle of Jesus Christ by one who, uh, who is going forth and yes, has the task of planting churches and pushing forward the work of, of Christ. However, there, this, 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 Paul is a unique apostle along with the original 12. Um, these are, these are, you know, the original, well, yeah, the original 12, you know, the 12 disciples and, and the you know, Jews who hangs himself later, they were ones who were eyewitnesses to the works of Jesus. They were, they were called by Jesus to follow him, handpicked by Jesus, trained by Jesus, raised up by Jesus. And, and some could even argue that maybe, you know, while the apostles, after Judas died, they drew straws, and you can read about this in Acts, they drew straws to replace Judas. And some would argue that Paul, because of his experience on the road to Damascus, in many ways, he was the one that replaced Judas. Which kind of teaches us something. We don't, if someone's called to follow God and something happens and they either fall away or they die, 
Um, we don't necessarily pick who God calls. God still calls people to fill those roles on his own. Uh, he doesn't need our help doing it. Now, that's a whole other argument. No, 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 excuse for any time. But something interesting here in verse 1, too, though. So notice Paul says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. So he's, he's one of the, these few select that have seen Jesus and are handpicked by Jesus to carry on the message. And uh, in this specific title, in this specific office. But notice what he, he talks about. He talks about Timothy, our brother. Timothy is there with him. I understand Paul is writing this letter while he's in prison, but he's not in a maximum maximum security prison. He's not a threat to those around him. He's not a threat to the world. Um, he's literally there because he appealed to Caesar. So he's kind of in a in a secure living facility. He's allowed to have visitors come and go, and people are allowed to come and bring him things. It's just Paul himself is kind of like on house arrest. So Timothy is there with him, and Timothy is... Is someone that Paul has brought to the faith through his ministry. Paul ministered to Timothy in the area of Timothy. Timothy got saved under the ministry of Paul. But notice how Paul addresses Timothy here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by God's will, and Timothy, our brother. So here's Paul, one of these leaders of the church, set apart by God to be the leader of the work of Christ and pushing it uh, to, the, to its uttermost boundaries. And here he is with this person that he helped lead to the Lord. And how does he, he's not looking down upon Timothy. He's not, he's not considering Timothy beneath himself. And Paul addresses Timothy and introduces Timothy here. He introduces him as my brother or as our brother. He, he sees Timothy as an equal. Yes, we may hold different positions and titles within the church. But in the end, it's Jesus Christ who unites us. It's Jesus Christ who's placed us in any office we might hold. That doesn't make us better or worse than anybody else because in God's eyes, we're all brothers and sisters in faith through Him. So, anyway, so that's kind of in verse 1. That's something I wanted to highlight here. Uh, verse 2, it says, To the saints in Christ at Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father. So to the saints in Christ. Uh, what's interesting about this um, well, Let's move on to verse 3. Verse 3 says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Um, here in this opening verse here, or in verse 3, so Paul introduces himself, he gives this opening greeting, and now he's moving into kind of the his opening remarks here and greeting towards the Col Colossians, right? He's actually you know, commending them. And he says, I thank God for you, um, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. So when he is addressing Jesus, or as God the Father, being the Father of Jesus, he's he's kind of calling about that fact that you know Jesus is was was born of the Virgin Mary, that he was conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit, that God is his Father, and we know from the Gospels when Jesus refers to God as Father, this makes the Pharisees angry, this makes the religious leaders angry, and many of the Jews because they realize what he's saying. Jesus, through this title and claiming God as his Father, is is essentially putting himself at, at one with God. He's claiming divinity for himself. He's claiming himself to be deity. And Paul is kind of confirming that in this opening statement uh, uh, past the greeting here. In verse 3, he's saying, We thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. So knowing that, he also is praying. He's also praying for, for this church too. Um, so as we go into verses 3 through 6, so there's kind of a, a chunk of verses that really make up a unit together. And I probably could have done a whole video just on these three verses, but I'm not going to spend as much time on them as I probably should. Um, but I, what you're going to see here is that these three verses, verses 3, 4, 5, and, uh, four, five, and 6, they, they kind of all go together. These, this the section of verses right here. And, and um, I like the way the Wycliffe commentary puts it. It says, if we have hope and only in this life, we are to be pitied. And he's talking about we as we as in Christians. But if our hope resides in heaven where the new age is actualized in the person of Christ, it will manifest itself in love and bring forth fruit in the present world. And so that's what really Paul is getting at. If your faith is in this Jesus who claims to be not only the Son of God, but to be 
God himself, God in the flesh, if you place your faith in this Jesus, and this is what's going to become evidenced in your life. This is how your life is going to be lived out in evidence of that faith in this Jesus. This is how it's going to change you. And kind of in verse 2, two kind of going backwards a little bit, notice what Paul says, to the saints in Christ. So he's referring to all those who believe in Jesus, and they believe in Jesus not because of the head knowledge, not because someone told them or they've read the Bible stories and they've heard the stories, but because somehow, either through those teachings or through their prayer life or through some other spiritual event in their life, they've had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. They experienced Jesus in their personal life, and that, and that experience of Jesus changed them, and, that's, and it ignited their faith, and it's that faith in Jesus then it unites the church together. That's what unites any church together. That's what unites any Christian together. It's faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's the Jesus that who Paul outlines for us in verse 3. In verse 4, he goes on to say, For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. So one of the things that's going to be evident in our life, if we're following Jesus, is we are going to love other Christians. You know, so many times, especially right now in our world, we're talking about how, you know, Jesus loves everybody. And there's, that's true. Jesus does love everybody. Jesus is, is God in the flesh. And we know the will of God is that everyone would come to repentance. That there isn't, some, there isn't anybody that God wouldn't want to come and seek forgiveness from him. God, will, wills that, God doesn't want anybody to perish, but he wants everybody to live through faith in Jesus. Jesus is that way to eternal life. And God is calling everybody to that kind of faith. He's drawing everybody to that. And so we understand that concept that we're to love everybody, but especially those of us who are part of the faith together. Those of us who uh, claim Jesus as Lord. We are to love one another. Uh, there's, a, there's a Christian song out there uh, by Derek Webb, and in that song he talks about how you can't love God, you can't say you love Jesus, and not love the church. Hey, I get it. Sometimes it's hard to go to church. So, hey, I get it. Sometimes Christians can be hard-headed. They can be hypocritical. They can be mean. They can be rude. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus died on the cross for them. Jesus is transforming them. They, they are gathering together, seeking the presence of Jesus so that to grow closer to God, to grow closer to one another. Um uh, that, when I was talking about that song Derek Webb, from Derek Webbermaker, Derek, Derek talks about in, his, in that song that, that the church is the bride of Christ and you can't say you love Jesus and not love his bride. Uh, think about it. If, if you go to somebody and they're married to someone and you say you don't like their spouse, it's going to be really hard for you to have a relationship with a person you do like because you don't like their spouse. It's going to make it complicated. It's going to make it awkward. It's going to make it almost impossible. Because in that person's mind, yes, they may be friendly towards you, but in the back of their mind, they're going to remember, hey, this person doesn't like my spouse, so i got to be careful. Because my loyalty first is to my beloved, to the one that's betrothed to me. And that's who the church is. The church is the one that's betrothed to Jesus. And Hey, and again, I know right now in our world, and, and as we see news headlines and of mega church pastors following, we see you know, Christians doing things that aren't Christian-like or, or, or not representing Jesus in the way that they should be representing Jesus. I know it's real easy to become become hateful and, and derogatory towards Christians and run them down, but here's the thing. We have to be careful of that because when we do that, we are running down the body of Christ. Yes, there are things that the, that the church needs to be called to repentance on. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. But understand, the church is made up of believers in Jesus Christ. We are to love the church and we are to call people to her. We are to gather together as believers and focus on Christ. And I mean, it's amazing when we focus on Jesus and put our eyes towards Him and, and on the task that He's called us to, it's amazing what happens, how small the difference has become. But our, fo our focus has to be on Jesus. Um, and that's why He's commending in this opening verses of Colossians, He is commending these, these Colossians on the fact that, hey, I've heard about you. I've heard about your faith in Jesus and, and the love that you have for each other. That's awesome. I applaud the love that you have. Kind of on this idea of loving the church too. That Jesus commands us this in John chapter 13, right? He says, I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. Again, church, if, if we can't even love one another, how can we expect to love anybody in the world? If we can't even get a, love one another and get along with one another within, the, within our own 
fellowships and our own local bodies, how can we expect anyone on the outside looking in to come, want to come in and be a part of what Jesus is trying to do in our midst? We're going to poorly represent the work of what Jesus is doing. That's what happens. So, um, that's what occurs. Uh, if, if we don't love one another, if we actually love one another, and we're, we're carrying out this command of Christ, that's how the world's going to recognize us. That's actually, I think Jesus goes on to say that in verse, I read in 13, 34, and 35, Jesus is going to go and say that. The world's going to know that you're my disciples by the way that you love one another. So, we need to represent that love to one another, both when we're gathered together. And here's another thing. Don't say, I love, I love my, you know, don't, don't, when you gather with your church, don't say, I love my church and I love, I love the people of my church. But then when you go home on Sundays or and when you're, or when you're alone in, in, your, in your own little separate fence circles, don't be mad mouth in your church there. Uh, again, I'm not saying you can't critique it. I can't, I'm not saying you can't ask for prayer for your church. I'm not saying that there aren't differences that need to be overcome or, or even things that need to be repented of. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying though is we need to, to love the body of Christ. We need to love other members who are the body of Christ as well. And we have to start there before we could even ever hope to demonstrate love to the world. All right. So that's Colossians chapter four, verse one, verse four. Um, of Later on, so, you know, John the Apostle pins in his gospel that statement from Jesus. In his letter of 1 John, the same apostle, in John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 10, is going to write this. He says, the one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. So again, we have to do our best to lay our differences aside and focus on the one thing that we have in common when we have, when we have faith in Jesus and we're a part of the church. We need to for, for, our first and foremost focus must be on Jesus himself. And whenever we come to places where we can't agree, we have to stop focusing on what we disagree on and take our eyes back to Jesus. And Jesus will always encourage us and then point our eyes back toward the mission. Anyway, verse 5. So for we have, uh, verse 5 says, Because of the hope reserved for you in heaven, you have already heard about this gospel and the hope of... Or, because of the hope reserved for you in heaven, you have already heard about this hope in the word of God, truth, the gospel. So that word gospel there. Uh, I love what uh, this is John MacArthur put, writes this about it. He says that the, the word gospel, the Greek word literally means good news. And it's used in classical Greek to express the good news of victory in battle. The gospel is the good news of Christ's victory over Satan's sin and death. That's what Jesus did for us. When he came and died on the cross and rose again, he provided for the forgiveness of our sins that we could have never obtained for on our own. And then he rose again to give us power so that sin would no longer have a hold upon us. The temptations that the enemy throws at us because of what Jesus did for us at the cross, the good news of the gospel is they no longer have the same power or hold over us as long as our faith remains in Jesus and we continue to follow after him. The good news of the gospel is the power of Jesus, is the power of God has overcome evil. That is the good news of the gospel. That is the good news that Paul is proclaiming here and, and throughout, throughout this ancient world. That's what the other apostles are going to proclaim throughout the book of Acts as the church begins to grow and spread. And that's what Paul's going to talk about. He says, you have already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel. You've heard the good news. And in verse 6 he goes, and that has come to you it is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you've heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. Again, what Paul's getting at is there were, you know, many of these, maybe some of these Colossian Christians, they had heard the message one time and that was enough for them. But some of them, it probably took two, three times, five or six months, five, maybe, maybe it took a considerable amount of time for that message of the gospel to really make an impact and for them to realize what was made available to them and what it meant. There's a moment where their heart and their eyes was open and they appreciated the work of God's grace and what God had done for them. And that moment when they appreciated, that's when everything changed. That's when they repented and, and they changed their minds and changed the direction of their lives. They changed their minds about who they were. They changed their minds that they were sinners. 
they changed their mind about Jesus and that Jesus was the Savior. And that caused them to change the way they lived. And just as it made that same change in their life, that gospel message, that good news that the apostles were sharing, it was changing lives all over the world where they were proclaiming it. I mean, read the book, again, go read book, the book of Acts. You'll see it all over the place. Every time the good news is pro proclaimed, whether it's Peter or John or Philip, the evangelist, you name it, Barnabas, Saul, any of these guys that are speaking in the name, or speaking the name of Jesus and, and presenting the good news, thousands of people get saved and their lives are changed forever. It's still happening in our world today. When you proclaim the good news of Jesus, it changes lives. Um, I'm going to share a story. And, and you know, not only does it provide salvation in life, sometimes it brings ultimate healing. And the reason I'm going to share that with you and, and say that is um for a while there I was I had the opportunity to share in some in some villages in a, in a different nation, uh, in a different part of the world, and and uh, I just simply just share do my best to share simple messages about Jesus Christ and and and, and what's and the, and the good news of Him. And about the second time I had done this, I'd asked the group because again I had to have a translator because I didn't speak the language. I said, hey, am I even being effective here? And they responded by saying, yeah. And I was like, not only are people getting saved, but we've had people who were addicted, listen. And through the power of Jesus, they were set free from their addiction. We had people that came in deaf and they left being able to hear. I didn't preach, you know, I wasn't, you know, necessarily preaching for healing. I wasn't praying for that kind of healing. I was simply preaching the good news of Jesus. But in the name of Jesus, through the power of Jesus, not only were, were they, did they find the forgiveness of their sins, but they found power to be healed from whatever their ailment was. That's what the good news of Jesus does. It brings healing. It brings hope. It changes things. It transforms people. It transforms communities. It transforms our lives. And that's the good news that, that Paul was proclaiming. And that's the good news that, that, that these Colossians experienced and that they were living out. And this is what Paul's commended them for. That the gospel that, that they heard, that they appreciated, that... The bared fruit in them and bear began to and is bearing fruit all over the place, and it has the power to do the same thing in our lives and through our lives, if we surrender ourselves to it. And surrender is a theme of the Bible. You have to surrender to it. If you want to have victory in your life in the name of Jesus, you want to have the, this victory that is the good news. You have to surrender your life to God to experience it. There's no other way. It seems contradictory. It seems backwards. Because we live in a world that's based on survival of the fittest. And you have to be the strongest, the most powerful. You have to be the hard-headed and the most stubborn. But, in the, but the reality of it is the way of Jesus, the way of the cross, the way of the kingdom of God is through surrender, through faith in Jesus and yielding your life to the grace that is, that, to his grace to, and its power to transform you and transform the world around you. Well, that's verse six, man. Good stuff, right? Verse six. I'm going on to verse seven. It says, you learn this from um, Epaphras, our dearly loved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on, our, on your behalf, and he has told us about your love in the Spirit. So again, it, it, it depends on which scholar you read. There's a debate among the scholars. Where, uh, so, so Paul, we know if, from studying the book of Acts, goes on these missionary journeys. He travels all over parts of Asia and, and, and Europe and, and all over the place spreading the good news of the kingdom. We know for a season he goes to the, the, the city of Ephesus, which is a major city hub, it's going to be a major place of influence for the church moving forward. Uh, the Apostle John is going to spend the later years of his career there. Uh, but Paul goes there, and he, he's really the one create, um, you know, credited with, with the, the majority of the work in Ephesus. And, and, and the Colossae, where the Colossians are from in the city, is about 100 miles from there. And so the debate among scholars is, okay, was, was it, did Paul directly go to Colossae and plant this church, or did he send a team out? to this, this city and have them preach and plant the church. That, that, that's up for debate. But in the end, it doesn't really matter. This, this church of Colossae was formed through the influence of Paul, whether he was physically there or not. This town was ministered to because of, of the evangelist and, the, and the, the willfulness of Paul's ministry, the obedience to the ministry of Paul. I hope you knew what I meant there. I'm getting excited and I'm talking really fast and my brain's going faster than my mouth. So hopefully that made sense. If not... We'll sort it out later. Um, but what we do know is this, that Epaphras 
is the pastor that oversees this church. So some think he may have even been the pastor that planted the church and continued to oversee it when Paul's missionary journey continued. Again, not, not really any certainty or confirmation one way or the other, and then guess in the long grand scheme, it doesn't really pay out. But Epaphras is the pastor here, and how do we know that? Because at the end of verse 7, it tells us, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has told us about your love in the Spirit. So everything Paul is about to address, and everything that Paul is grateful for about this church, and he's, he's praising them for, he has heard, from Epaphras. Epaphras. Epaphras has shared this with him. He said, hey, this is this church. This is what they're doing good. This was, this is, they're loving one another and they are, and then the, and the, the gospel, the good news is growing, is, is, is changed them and it's transforming them. But he's also going to be the one that tells Paul the challenges that that church has faced and that's why Paul's writing this letter to challenge, to address as a leader in the church, to address what's happening here. And to kind of give Epaphras a little bit more, you know, uh, the backing uh, to, to address the, the things that are going on and giving him the authority through him, that Jesus has given him. Given, so Paul's gotten the authority from Jesus, and Paul's using that authority to help Epaphras address this issue. All right, so verse 9. Oh, wait. I kind of read 7, 8 there, and they kind of go together, so that worked out. Uh, let's see, on the verse 9, it says, For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. So whatever Paul's heard about, and, and which he could either be referring to the things that are, he just mentioned that he's thankful for, or he could be meant, or he could be re in reference to the things that he's getting ready to address, or it could be a combination of both. But whatever it is, Paul's saying, hey, we haven't stopped praying for you. No matter where I go or, or what I'm up to, I think about you and I pray for you. Um, and that's the thing about when you're ministering in the name of Jesus is the people that you're ministering to and in the areas that you're ministering to, you can't do that properly without giving up a piece of yourself. You can't do it properly without uh, giving all of yourself to it. You, ha you give all yourself to it. You pour all of yourself into it. And when God pull calls you away elsewhere and God sends you elsewhere to continue on the work, that doesn't mean those pieces of you that you poured out in those areas go with you. They stay there. You don't get those back. Yes, God will fill you again, and God will give you the strength and energy to continue on into the next place where you're serving and the next opportunity, the next person you come to. But the things that you've given out and you minister to and those you missed to in the past, that, that you don't get those back. In some ways, you still continue to minister, I mean, especially nowadays through technology. We're able to stay in contact with people a lot, a lot easier and from further distances, and you can still minister to them and, and share advice and, and pray for them and lift them up before the Lord. And even, even if that's not the case, you don't stay in touch. The, the heart is still there. The love is still there. Um, so, anyway, that was a sidetrack bunny trail, but I felt like it was an important one. All right, verse 9. And he goes on, though. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So even though that, that the, this encounter of the good news has changed them and transformed their lives, Paul is saying, not only are you transformed through the renewing of your mind, I want you to continue to be transformed. I want you to continue uh, to be filled with knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I want, I want you to continue to pursue those things. I want you to have those things. Um, and what he's calling them to is not just a, a, an impression or a feeling. He's calling them to this, this deep knowledge of, that goes to the very core of their heart and very core to their mind. It becomes, in some ways, their identity. That they are one with Christ and, 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 and it's, the, it's Christ who lives in them. Not you know the old them has been crucified with Christ, and it's not they who live anymore, but it's Christ in them that lives. Um, I love uh, the white again the white cliff commentary had some good stuff this week, and it it said this says a mental transformation is prerequisite to and the basis for ethical renewal. So basically, what Paul is saying is. Yes, you've been transformed and saved through the power of God's grace, but now allow that grace to change the way you live your life. 
and it will become the proof of the work that Jesus has already done. Again, we don't do works to earn our salvation. You can never do enough good things to earn our salvation. However, if you have faith in Jesus, it will produce good works in you because God is producing good work in your heart and in your mind. And because he's changing your heart from the evil to the good, and he's producing those good things in you, the natural flow from that process is the good. That good is going to spill over from your mouth and through your hands and your feet. And I'm saying, you know, what I mean by that is it's going to come out through your words and it's going to come out through your actions. And so he goes on in the Wycliffe commentaries that go on and says, in turn, as they are fruitful in every good work, their knowledge of God will be further cemented in their minds. So that's the thing as we're, as you know, we are saved, you're sanctified in moments. But that work continues. God continues to transform us. And, and as, it, as that good work produces in us and, and pushes us more to good work, it's going to deepen our understanding of God. It's going to deepen our love for Him. And that's going to drive us to do more good works and more evidences of what the work of God is doing inside of us. Again, you can't ever do good enough, enough good things to earn your salvation. However, if you are truly saved, if you are truly being transformed by the power of God's grace, you won't be able to keep that grace to yourself. I mean, it's, it's, it's the presence of God in your life. And God is much too vast, much too big to be put in a box, let alone to be con, 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 contained and confined to your own being. No, he's, he's, he's going to pull you to the church and through you and through the church. His good works are going to abound through, 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 one, through us and through our love for one another. And that's going to give evidence to the work that God's doing in, in us and in our midst. All right. So that was verse 9. We talked about transformation. All right, verse 10. And he goes on. He says, So that you may walk faithfully, I'm sorry, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. And so what he's getting at here is that this, you know, we, we mentioned in a second ago that this, this good work that's, that, that's, that's pouring out of you because of the Spirit inside you, that, that is proof that God has changed you and God is changing you. I know I use two different, uh, what is it, versions of the word. I used the present and the past tense at the same time, and I did it on purpose. It wasn't an accident. You were changed and you're changing still. Right? And that's what God is doing. And it's going to be evidence to the, to the things that you say and the things that you do. And that's the thing. If you are truly walking faithfully with God, if to be walking worthy with God, you're not walking worthy with God because you yourself are worthy. You're doing. You're walking worthy with God because the Spirit of God inside of you, doing this good work inside of you, and that's driving you to good works, is enabling you to do that. The Spirit of God, being filled with the Holy Spirit, is what enables us to live a life worthy of the Lord. You and I do not have the strength or capability within ourselves to meet God's standards. That's why Jesus had to go and die on the cross. Right? So many people think, I mean, yes, Jesus had to go die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. That was part of that. That was part of that plan. So our sins had to be forgiven. But we also had to have the ability, if we were going to walk worthy with God, to not sin anymore, to choose not to sin, to choose a, a different pathway. And God, through the Holy Spirit, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, made the Holy Spirit available to us to fill us and enable us to live that life out that's worthy of God. And the only life that's worthy of the Lord, or a, a person that's walking worthy of the, of the Lord, is going to have the evidence of this fruit about their life. If there's no fruit, there's no fruit being being presented. If they're not bearing fruit in every good work and growing in their knowledge of Christ, then you're not walking worthy with the Lord. To walk worthy with the Lord is to bear fruit. And you can't walk worthy with the Lord and you can't bear fruit unless we're growing in our understanding and our knowledge. You see how those things are all interconnected? You can't, so often as theologians, we, we, we try and separate those and oftentimes we will preach on them separately and 
is because we only have 30 minutes and and let's face it nobody wants to sit there for longer than 30 minutes some of you probably have quit watching the video because this video has gone longer than 30 minutes <laughs> okay if you're still here at the 35 mar ma minute mark do yourself a favor and pat yourself on the back give yourself a clap of hands right all right but this is what the spirit's doing inside of us this is what the spirit's doing the spirit is producing these good works inside of us again not earning our salvation but proof of the salvation that god has already brought to our lives all right i beat that horse to death let's move on to verse 11. It says being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you might have great endurance and patience joyfully giving thanks to the father so this god's giving you strength that way you can continue to do the good work that's going to be evidence of the work jesus is doing inside of you that is the good news of the kingdom. And it's going to give you the strength to keep doing it even when things in life don't go your way. Even when your plan becomes completely unraveled. Even when people are mean to you around you. Even when, peop uh, even when, when just bad things happen. It's going to give you this, not just patience to endure it, not just strength to endure it, but notice what Paul says. He's, he's, he's going to give you, give you the ability to, be, to, to joyfully go through it. You see, the Spirit of God inside of you isn't something that this world can rob you of. It can quench it. It can, it can cause you to suppress it. It can cause you to say no to it. But if you continually surrender, if surrender your life to the Spirit living inside of you, then there's really nothing in this world that can take that joy from you. Not that, that doesn't mean you're going to be happy about everything. Doesn't mean someone's gonna punch you in the face and you're just gonna smile about it. It might mean that, but for some of us, no. If someone punches you in the ocean, you're, it's not gonna feel good. But it's not gonna rob you of your peace with God. It's not gonna rob you of the, the purpose that God has for you. It's not gonna steal those things away from you, because your confidence isn't in others' opinions of you, or or even the circumstances that you find. Your 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 joy, your peace, your purpose is found in the Spirit of God that's doing the good work inside of you. And you realize that, that the call that God has upon your life is to be faithful to Him. Again, I know, I mean, I'm not trying to contradict what I said earlier about loving others and loving, and loving the church. I'm not contradicting that. But what I am saying is, so often we get mad about things in our Christian walk, about things that we can't control. Things that we can't manipulate to get them to go our way. And that's what steals us of our joy, of this, our joy in our lives. But if we learn to surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit and say, you know, God, that's beyond my control, but, but you know what I can do? I can surrender myself to you and what you've called me to do. And I can be faithful to who you've called me to be. I can be faithful to the good work that you're doing in me and the good works that you're placing before me. And I'll leave what I can't handle to you. And that, that's what restores our joy in those moments when we should be the most broken. So verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. And I love that, that he talks about this. The saints, and you know what the saints' inheritance is? It's suffering with Jesus. That's the inheritance of the saints. Yes, it's, yes, it's, it's, just, it's the reward. It's the promise of eternal life. Yes, that, that's part of it. But do you realize while we're here on this earth, we, part, of what, part of what we have to count as joy for ourselves is the fact that we are counted as the ones worthy to suffer in the same manner that our Savior suffered. So just as the kingdom of an eternal life is the inheritance today, so is the suffering. See, suffering when you're when you're following just isn't a sign that you're lacking faith. Suffering is actually a sign that you've been counted one worthy in your faith to and given the strength to be able to endure such things. I love what John Wesley had to say. This is the highest point, not only to know, do, and to suffer the whole will of God, but to suffer it to the end, not merely with patience, but with thankful joy. We as Christians, we act to our suffering in our lives differently than the world around us. And I know it's difficult. It's hard for us. We have to unlearn a pattern, patterns established in this world that are based on pride and selfishness and, and disappointment of not getting what we want. 
as we grow in the good work of what God is doing in our lives, our reaction to the way that things happen in our life is going to change. And we're going to respond to those things differently. All right. Um, we've heard the word term light used a lot. Um, and oftentimes light's referring to truth and the truth is what the, the word of God, right? And the light shines in the darkness, you know, okay. Verse 13. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. So this is talking about God who has rescued these Colossians, who has rescued you and I from the darkness and transformed us from the dark, the kingdoms of this world, which are saturated in the darkness, are founded upon the darkness, are wielded and have their power through the powers of darkness. He has transformed us from that, transferred us from that kingdom into the kingdom of Jesus whom God loves and who loves us. And I think John MacArthur nails it on this, on this point. I keep in mind John MacArthur theologically and I have a lot of dis things to disagree about and not have in common. But he, I agree with him on this one. And so he says, he says, this is more than just the future. More than just earthly millennial kingdom. This everlasting kingdom speaks of the realm of salvation in which all believers live in current and eternal spiritual relationship with God under the care and authority of Jesus Christ. And what, what MacArthur is getting at and what Paul is saying here to these Colossians is the moment you accepted the good news of Jesus into your life and that good news began to transform you through God's grace and produce these good works and evidence of the good work God's doing inside of you. You were switched from the kingdom's found upon the darkness of this world to the kingdom of the Son of whom God loves. It means your citizenship has transferred. So your citizenship is no longer of any kingdom of this earth. It is of the kingdom of heaven. It is of the kingdom of God, a kingdom not of this world, a kingdom that cannot be corrupted by this world because it's not of this world. It's a kingdom that is that was and is and is to come. I said it all wrong, but there's songs about it. Yes, there's a day where, where this kingdom of God, this, this, this kingdom of the realm of salvation that, that we as Christians and these Colossians belong to will come in its fullness. And, but our citizenship doesn't wait to begin until that moment. Our citizenship began the moment we, we, we confess Jesus as our Lord. We publicly, we publicly declare that citizenship through the, through the ritual of baptism. When we are baptized in the name of Jesus, we are declaring to the world that I am no longer a citizen of this world and the powers of this world. I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. That kingdom of heaven has already been established here. It's just not come in its fullness yet. But in the meantime, but you and I, we continue to live as citizens of that kingdom until it arrives in its fullness. And so what Paul is essentially getting at, and what he's praying over these Colossians, when he's talking about them living, walking worthy of the Lord, he's saying, walk worthy of the citizenship of heaven that you have. You, don't you no longer represent the ways of this world and of the old self. You represent the kingdom of Jesus. So live and walk and act like you represent the kingdom of Jesus. And how do you do that? By reflecting the kingdom of the Son He loves. By loving the Son and loving the others who place their faith in the Son. I'm not talking about the Son, the, the, the giant ball of gas. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. In verse 14, he goes on to say this, Paul writes, he says, in him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, um, the Nazarene theologian, uh, what's his last name? I don't know what his last name is, or his first name is, but his last name is Nielsen. He says, this is his redemption means emancipation 
or a loosing from the powers of the dominion of darkness, from both the guilt and power of sin. That's what Jesus did for us. He emancipated us. He freed us from the powers of darkness. What are the powers of darkness? Satan, sin, and death. Jesus, through his death and resurrection on the cross, set us free from the dominion of darkness. And I like what Nielsen says is from the guilt of sin. Guilt is, is when you recognize that you sinned against God, that you are, you are on the wrong side, of, uh, wrong side, that you are choosing to live in disobedience to God. And then God's not the problem. The world's not the problem. Your church isn't the problem. The real problem to your Christian walk is you and you doing it for trying to do it for yourself. You trying to live your life for yourself. That's the guilt. And we realize that we have this guilt about us because we realize that we're wrong. Guilt, the feeling of guilt in us, it's weird because God does not use the guilt. God doesn't make you feel guilty. That's not what he does. What, God, what happens is the whole, we encounter the holiness of God and it reveals who we are. And when we see ourselves truly in, as we are in the presence of God, realizing how holy he is and how holy we are not, that's what creates the guilt. Our sinfulness, our wickedness, our unrighteousness is what makes us feel guilty. We Jesus freed us from that. Because he tell, through, through his death on the cross, he says, the sin that you're guilty of, I took your guilt. I took the punishment for what you feel guilty for. I died for that already. That's already been punished with me. But it doesn't stop there. Because I love this. I love what Nielsen says because we, so many of us live our great lives, Christian lives defeated. It's like, all right, I know Jesus loves me and he forgives me, but I can't stop doing these bad things. It's because we don't realize that through the power of Jesus and his spirit inside of us, he, also, he not only loosed us from the powers of the guilt connected to sin, he loosed us from the power of sin. Sin doesn't dictate how we live our lives. It doesn't dictate the decisions we make. No, when we surrender to the spirit inside of us, the spirit is going to train our heart and our minds to recognize the choices we have in the moment. And the choices will always include God's way or the way of sin. Is the Spirit will reveal to us which way to choose and, and help us to make the right choice. That's what we have through Jesus. We have not only the pardon, but the power. He loosed us from the powers of sin. I don't know about you, but that, 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 that inspires me, that encourages me. And, and as Paul is getting ready to address the issue facing these Colossians, he begins by what two things. He thanks them for their faith in Jesus and, and the evidence produced, or the evidence of the good works that, 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 that the transformation has produced in them. He also prays for them and, said, and he's praying for them that they lit, walk worthy of the Lord. And not only does he just call them that, he tells them how that's possible. And I hope tonight you understand and that that's what's possible for you too. Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of sin. You don't have to feel guilty about this in your life. Yes, when you're, you're in, if you're in that moment before the Holy Spirit right now, the Holy Spirit, you're feeling that conviction, that presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes, he might be convicted, but the guilt you're feeling isn't of God. It's of your own sinfulness. But God wants you to know in this moment that he loves you and Jesus has already paid the punishment for that, what you're feeling guilty for. Confess it and be free from it. But also that he wants you to, to ask him for the power of the Holy Spirit that's within you to fill you and help you to, to learn to discern and make the choice that's God honoring. The one that's going to help you to walk worthy of the Lord. Look worthy of the citizenship of heaven that he's given you. Let me pray for you. Dear God, I thank you for the truth of your word and the encouragement that gives us and the life that it calls us to. But Lord, it's not, while you call us to this life that seems impossible and, and beyond us, God, you didn't leave us to accomplish on our own because you knew we weren't capable of it. God, you gave us your Holy Spirit to fill us, to empower us, 
to live in the way that you've called us to, so that we would be able to walk lives worthy of the citizenship that you've granted us. I pray, Lord, for anyone, maybe they're, they're sensing guilt in their life because of, of unconfessed sin, Lord. Help them to realize that that, that sin that they're hold, that, that they're, they're, that's making them afraid and feel unworthy before you, Jesus has already died for. They're already forgiven for. God, may they experience that forgiveness. May they find the freedom through confessing that sin to you. But Lord, more than that, would you fill them with your spirit so that they can live their lives differently in pursuit of you now. Well, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.